Um, this morning I, I'm going to preach the second message on the series on Matthew. You know, in the small books we're studying Matthew, the whole church. We really want to get to know this one Bible book, Matthew. And uh, so last week I talked about Matthew chapters 1 and 2. And Matthew chapter 1 and 2, the stage is being set for what's to come. In Matthew chapter 1 and 2, we find out about Jesus' family tree. We find out about the pregnancy. We find out about, you know, who was there when he was born. We find out where he was born, where he grew up, and what happened as a child. So the state, and we get to hear the name of the child. Jesus means God saves, and also known as Emmanuel, God with us. So, wow, so... That's really preparing us for what's to come. And now we just wait as the reader of the book. We just wait for the names to become programmed. You know, how is God going to save? What is he going to do? And then chapter 3, that's what I'm preaching on, on today. It finally happens. You know, Jesus has grown up. But before he is on the scene, there's another man that begins the ministry. And according to Matthew, he prepares the way for Jesus to come. But they would initially certainly carry the same message and so this this man his name is John he's located in a wilderness area not too far away from Jerusalem by the river Jordan and there all the people would come and his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near repent if you get to hear the message and you get reminded of all the prophecies that God would come and He would save and sort out His people and help. Would you be prepared that the first message is repent? I mean, don't we all wait for God to do something and suddenly we got to do something? And is that even fair? You know, the people of God, the nation of Israel, for 14 generations they had not a king on the throne. Even though they, they held on to an old prof, promise that was given to King David that one of his descendants will always be on the throne. There will be a king again. And so finally Jesus comes, the Messiah, the anointed, the king of kings. You want him to be on the throne and reign and do something. But no, repent. That's the message first. And then, you know, for 400 years there hasn't been a prophetic voice like in the days of old in the nation. So they've been hungry for the Word of God. Malachi is the last prophet in the Bible. 400 years of what's next. And then, yeah, for almost 100 years they were oppressed by the Romans. And they tortured and executed people. People were dying on crosses. You know, oppressed, taxed out of their possessions. Everything. So you're downtrodden people. How would you take to it if the first message is repent? How are you going? <laughs> Sitting there right now, you know? I, I know how we are humans, you know, sometimes we sit here. God, how could you? I'm having a miserable life, you know, I dare you. And, and so in, instead of us repenting, it's God that needs to repent. <laughs> so, God, shape up a bit more. Like, all your promises, where are they? <laughs> we can all have bad age. <laughs> this is, it gets a bit hard. We all get a bit like that. So it's not an easy message to hear. But I've got to finish that point because I have more to say. <laughs> um, do you remember the story that <laughs> Roland Baker told of his grandparents in China? And uh, so an amazing revival there. But early 1900s, China is a bit like the Wild West. There is no government there. The gangs are ruling everything. Whoever's the most violent wins. It's rampant capitalism without any social net or nothing. So. Um, his grandparents went to a part in China that wasn't accessible really to anyone. Just way in the way deep outback of China. So people ruled by the gun and whatever. And so 
there were guys that were owning tin mines. And the owner of the tin mines would go to the surrounding villages and basically pay the parents a little bit of money, take their children, primary school age, 9, 10, 11 years old, and they would work them in the tin mines. You know, little holes, only children can go, get into them. And then they had to dig the tin out and, and they work them pretty much to death. Not even really feeding them. Just so, and they, they work until they die. And when they die, they just throw them into the bushes and get new kids. It's just like no, no one cares. So a few of those kids, abused, exploited, abandoned by their families, they, man they don't quite die immediately. They crawl to the, back to town. It takes them a long time to crawl back into town. And there were the grandparents of uh, Warren Baker. And uh, the grandfather was doing missionary stuff. But the, the grandmother just took in the kids. Was looking for something to do, just took in the kids. Two out of three died within the first few days when they took... They were so far gone. They were just... Um, people said, why would you spend your energy and time on these? They will never amount to anything. Um, and the kids, those that survived, were not interested in the Christian faith. They were not interested in chapel. They were not interested in the Bible. They just wanted to play or do something else. And then the Holy Spirit falls on them. And you can read it in the, the book, Visions Beyond the Veil. The, the, the grandparents of Roland Baker didn't really have nothing to do with it. But God would put them in visions for days, for, for, for weeks, for months. They would just come out long enough to have a meal. And then together they would be, in, they would be taken up to heaven and, and everything. And all the children, and this is the detail that is a bit confronting, all the children... Before they experienced anything else in those visions, they would be coming under conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit. And all of the children, all of the orphans, abused, dying, for days they would weep because they, the lostness of their condition was on them. So even for them, the first message that came from God was, Repent! And then... Um, you know, what they frequently experienced was, in those visions, they would be in chains. And they would be dragged in chains to hell. They actually, a lot of them saw the lake of fire, saw people burning it. Like you read in the Bible, they experienced the horror of it. And then the last, last second, they would be saved and Jesus would take them up to heaven. And then they would have all these experiences of heaven and the joy of heaven and the delight and singing and eating there and meeting people. They would see Bible scenes acted out or <coughs> they would come out of the visions and ask, you know, um, Grandfather Baker, whatever. You know, is there a story in the Bible where there's this boy that has a sling and there's this giant and, and he kills him with a stone? Is there something like that in the Bible? <laughs> okay. Repent. First message. Now, John the Baptist is preaching away, preparing the way, and then finally, you know, the whole people from everywhere, they come, it's pretty popular, a national movement. Finally, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of God's people turn up as well. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they come to, to check it out, and then John the Baptist, the first thing he says to them, you brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the come on wild? Okay. How would you feel about that kind of approach? It's not a bit blunt. It's not really diplomatic. It's not really winning favors with spiritual leadership. And I'll be told to honor spiritual leadership, you know, that properly. Is that smart? John the Baptist had a message of repentance, which is a message of confrontation. It basically means the way you are is not okay before God. And if you want to step into anything that God has for us, you have to change. It's 
So even if you put it really, really nicely and dress it up with really pleasant words, that's the message. We are not okay the way we are. And even the orphan children, they, they were coming under conviction of sin and they had a rotten life, but they knew it was just. God is just. Being lost as a human, it's just. We rebelled against Him. So, it's a message of confrontation. And sometimes in the Bible, and I'm going to trace it, it's not meek and mild. It's not mincing words. And especially not with the leadership of the people because they carry influence with the people. It got to be clear. Okay, I'm going to try. This is a little bit countercultural for us, I would say. Because you know that the verse that we probably are more prone to quote to one another is be still and just let God fight the battle for you. Don't say anything. Let him vindicate you. Just be honoring and silent. And Jesus himself, when he was before the Sanhedrin before the in Jerusalem, he was silent, you know. Just don't inflame things, tone it down and do your thing and be nice. This is Christian, be nice. So I will trace a little bit in the Gospel of Matthew how Jesus dealt with the spiritual leadership. And I think we may be in for a few surprises. Um, his message also was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And in the design of John and Jesus, he would not always remain on the fringe. He grew up in Nazareth, and you know, John was in the wilderness area outside of Jerusalem, but he would not always be on the fringe. Jesus came, he's the king of kings, and he would take the seat of power where the Pharisees and the Sadducees ruled, he would confront it, and he would take it. Because in Jerusalem, the first sermon would be preached after Jesus rose from the dead. And on the first day, 3,000 people would be saved. The whole city would be filled with the message of Jesus Christ, Him crucified, rose from the dead with power. I mean, this is a little bit good news. Jesus didn't come just to be a saviour, to be on the fringe, nicely tucked away and, you know, let the world be. He would change the world. Our task would be to disciple nations. Which means we are not all, always going to be stuck in Galilee, in Nazareth, in, in the insignificant villages. God's strategy was always to take the seat of power. Okay, how did it happen? Well, John the Baptist, he did call them a name, so brood of vipers, and then he's he reasoned with them also. So it's not like not he explained to them why. He said, don't just think because Abraham is your father that everything is okay. Don't just presume because all the promises that are given in the Bible, you are automatically part of them. You know, Abraham, you know, God makes him a promise that all his descendants that become a great nation. The whole world, all nations, would be blessed through Abraham. So you're one of the descendants of Abraham. You, you, you're right in the shower of blessing. You know, comparable today, as Christians would say, don't just think, hi, oh, because you go to church and you're baptized, you're okay. You're not. Actions you like, but you're not accessing the promises of the kingdom at all if there's no repentance. So he's explaining that to them. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The heart could have changed as well. Um, Jesus, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, he explains a little bit more. He has quite a few things to say about what's wrong. Um, he says, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Everything they do is done for people to see. And then they make their phylacteries, which is some boxes when they pray, you know, just, and tassels of the gums, they make them long and big. They love the place of honor, banquets, 
the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. You know, they have positions in the church. But they're full of pride. Their heart is wicked, unchanged. Everything they do is done for people to see. Okay, and then I quote, give, give you straight away a few quotes from Jesus. Why the leadership had to be tackled. He couldn't just leave them alone and, and not confront. Um, Jesus says, whoever does not gather with me scatters. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. So you can't, you can't have blind leaders. It's going to be damaging to the nation. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the picture there is yeast. When you have dough, it goes everywhere. It's contagious. If you leave the old guard, the leadership in place, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the culture that is in them will contaminate and spoil everything, the entire nation. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees and hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. So if, if you leave the old leadership in place, they will manage to shut the door to the kingdom of God to people that are hungry for it. Um, maybe just, a, you know, Jesus heals, he drives out demons. And the whole crowd, everyone is so happy. The demons are expelled. And then the Pharisees and teachers of the law come. And, you know, they might give a theological point, a teaching point. Ah, oh, it's by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Yeah, you, well, we know the Bible, we can say it's ridiculous. But if you don't know it's ridiculous, it actually confuses people. It confuses people. And like, you know, okay, but us, the miracles of God's Bibles, right? Throughout the entire church, throughout all Christians, there should be joy that God is performing miracles. Would you agree? Yeah. There should, is there joy? No, I mean, man, there's so many pastors that are saying that's of the devil. Stay away from it. <coughs> you know, the miracle of God has really brings us into disrepute. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Not good. Um, there's, there's one scene in the book of Acts. Um, Paul is healing a cripple, lame, I think lame from birth. The village is so excited about it, including the pagan priest. He, he brings the oxen to sacrifice to Paul and his fellow missionary as gods. They have such a high opinion of them because they performed this mighty miracle. And then there were some leaders of God's own nation coming from another town, coming in and, and stirring up the whole crowd. And they lose all their conviction. They, you know, they lose all their listening ears to Paul. They end up stoning Paul and leaving him for dead outside their village. That's what the wrong kind of leadership actually manages to do. So Jesus would deal with it. Um, how would he do it? In the first two chapters of Matthew, we have already come across that there's a strategy of withdrawing from conflict when it gets a bit too heated. So, you know, baby Jesus, um, there are great prophecies about, you know, being the Christ, the anointed king. And there's King Herod in Jerusalem that is a bit jealous for his throne. So he's a bit threatened by the baby that he hears about being born in Bethlehem. And so he becomes a little bit murderous, trying to kill all the babies of that area. So Jesus, what does he do? Does he confront Herod? No, he withdraws. So he withdrawing to Egypt, just evading the problem, the conflict. And then they, they come back from Egypt. And King Herod's son is still in Jerusalem and he's powerful. And Jesus and his family, again, they withdraw. They don't confront. They end up in Nazareth. 
And then throughout the gospel, when you read about it, Jesus frequently does it. You know, he, there's challenge, there's debate, and then it gets too heated, and just because, when it gets too heated, he withdraws and walks away. Uh, for instance, when um, John the Baptist is killed by King Herod, and, you know, things are flaring up in that instance, Jesus hears about it, and then he withdraws to another area, completely walks away from it. Um, he has another running with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, and teachers, and then the disciples say, hey, did, don't, don't you know that they got really offended when you were saying this, and things were heating up? And then with, he was with, withdrawing that time, and not even within the, the nation of Israel, he was in Gentile territory, uh, Tyre and Sidon. Um, I, I give you one example of that is in Matthew 12. So if you want to see the principle how it's working, it's in Matthew 12, 1 to 45. So it begins by being the Sabbath, the holy day, where you're not supposed to do any work, but Jesus' disciples are hungry and there's a field, a, a field that is ripe for harvest, and they pick a few heads of grain and just eat the grain. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they see that, they get offended, they say, Hey, Jesus, why do your disciples what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Okay, here we go again. So Jesus um, is reasoning with them. You know, haven't you read in the scriptures? There was something like King David did, and you know, it's a bit similar. And I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, it's going to be okay. So he reasons with them. And then another thing pops up, he's in the synagogue. And, you know, they're already waiting. They know Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. And they were convinced it's not okay. So Jesus knows what's going on. And he reasons with them again. Look, if your sheep falls into the pit on a Sabbath, don't you pick it up? Don't you rescue your sheep? You know, this man is far more important than a sheep. It's okay to do good on the Sabbath. So he reasons with them. It doesn't really settle them down at all. They're still waiting, what is he going to do? And there was a man with a crooked hand. And so, just picture, just picture. They're already seething a little bit. They're already a bit stirred up by Jesus. It's the synagogue, it's their territory, you know, the synagogue. And, they, and Jesus teaches them on it. He knows that they, their heart, their attitude hasn't changed. And he said, stretch out your hand. He stretches out his hand and he heals the man right in front of them. It gets them so upset that the Bible says they want to kill him. They plot to kill him. That's when he withdraws. Because it's not the time yet. So it's, it's not like he's not confronting them. But he's, he's picking the time when the final showdown happens. And it wasn't the time yet. So... If I had been in the synagogue on that day, and I, I would have given the authority by Jesus to heal on that day, if I had done what Jesus did, I would be in trouble with my wife. <laughs> if not with you. <laughs> well, wouldn't you agree? I mean, did you have to heal the guy right in front of them? You could have taken them on the side after the service. You know, like when they're having morning tea and have their coffee, you could have healed him on the side, quietly. Right? Hunger, godly, don't you always have to inflame things? Jesus is not what we expect him to be. He does inflame things. Because he's going to deal with the old God leadership and he's going to remove them. He would take the battle right into Jerusalem. When the time is right, he would go right in there. It's a bit full on. And um, actually, in that little story, he calls them, he reasons with them, stuff happens. And then the, he always ups. And it's just like he, he just, just he starts reasoning and then he starts abusing them. 
as they're actually not listening. And he calls him Lord of Wipers here as well. He's not toning anything down. And why not? Maybe initially, why not? Yeah? Because the leaders had power over innocent people and he was hurting and corrupting. Yeah, yeah. They're uh, like their people. Yeah, like, the you leaders know, were. yeah, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, if they're so set in their way, you can abuse them a fair bit. It's not really making any difference. You usually are not able to talk them around. Usually. But everyone that is listening in is certainly getting the message. You know, you're, you're basically, if Jesus, and he's not elected to anything. You know, he's, he's a peasant from Galilee. He isn't elected to an official, you know, people of God position in Jerusalem. He's not part of the system. And John the Baptist wasn't part of the system as well. They just said, I have a call from God. But he tears down the presumed power they had. He said, you think you have spiritual leadership and spiritual covering over your people? No, you're a brood of vipers. You're corrupted. And anyone listening in would say, hey, it's clear enough that you take notice. So Jesus finally comes to Jerusalem. And before that, he already tells his disciples, I'm going there, but I'm going to die. I'm actually going to be arrested by the old guard. I'm going to be mocked, spat upon, flogged, and I'm going to be killed. And after three days, I rise again. So Jesus, you know, that's part of the conflict as well. Maybe that's not because he says, follow me, and we, we are the, the same. Sometimes we are in conflict and we're meant to sacrifice. It costs us. It costs him everything. Um, so his sacrifice, his death was part of it. But he would be raised victorious. His sacrifice, the Father honored him. Um, it va validated him as the King of Kings. He gave him all the power. With the power that he had through his sacrifice and his resurrection, he commissioned us to disciple nations and revival would break out in Jerusalem. And then he gave a prophecy about that seat of power and already recognizing that you know, the, they wouldn't change their mind, but what would he do? It's part of, part of the whole story. What would he do? He would rip them apart that there would not be one stone left on one another. This is a bit removed from us because we're not really too Jewish thinking. We're not really in the culture. But Jerusalem and the temple controlled everything. They controlled the whole, entire Jewish nation on that lived in all the nations of the earth. They all traveled for the festivals to Jerusalem. The heart of worship, the heart of relating with God was um, in Jerusalem for the sacrifices that were performed at the temple. The, the whole seat of spiritual power was to everything that happened at the temple. And Jesus said, because you don't recognize me, because you don't repent, not one stone will be left on one another. This city will be sacked. And it happened within a generation after Jesus rose from the dead. The Romans came and they did not leave one stone on top of the other. And I can't explain. That's actually what um, the book of Revelation is on about. You know, when John the Elder is weeping in heaven because no one is worthy to open the scroll. This is not the day of the resurrection. This is the day when judgment would begin in Jerusalem. And taking, taking out the old power center of spirituality, God's people, it would be raised to the ground and there would just be Jesus. So when Jesus comes in, just to, um, when he comes to Jerusalem and it's finally showdown time, do you remember that he actually got physical? In, in the Gospel of Luke, we even hear that he has a whip in his hand. I mean, go into the temple and kick over the temple, you know, the, 
the tables and you throw them out. Physical. It's confrontational. And then he was teaching them. Again, his reasoning, his reasoning, his reasoning, explaining. You know, they try to trap him. That's, you know, they, they are hostile. They try to trap him because Jesus is popular. And, oh man, if he just gives one wrong answer, we got him. So they argue about marriage in heaven. They talk about um, taxes. They talk about the greatest commandment. And Jesus, every single time, perfect answer. It's just have no comeback. Perfect answer. And then finally the Bible says, they no longer dared to ask him anything. His wisdom was so superior, finally they ran out of puff. All, all the reasoning was done. You know, Jesus spent all the time they needed to talk things through. So they're without an excuse. And then, in typical Jesus fashion, he ups the ante again. This time he pronounces curses over them. Now, first... He tells parables against the leaders. <laughs> Luther was pretty rough at uh, Reformation time. He called the Pope a whore and everything. You know, like, I can't even repeat all the names he called. The corrupted seat of power at the time. And they needed Reformation and they, they did get reformed. Um, but I don't even think that he did what Jesus did. He told parables against the leadership. So all the, all the people are there, and then he told one parable after another, having a go at the leadership that is right there listening as well. I'll give you one of them. There's a guy that plants a vineyard. And then he gets tenants for his vineyard. And then when it's harvest time, he sends a servant of his, to get a share of the crop, like he's the landlord. The tenants don't want to pay. They abuse the first servant. He sends another one. They abuse him again. They beat him up. They abuse another one. All the servants get abused. So finally the landlord thinks, I'm going to send my son. Surely they're going to respect my son and I get a share of my crop. And then the tenants of the, the vineyard, they say, oh, that's the son in the air. We kill him and the vineyard is ours, so they kill him. And everyone knows Jesus is telling that against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Is that Christian? <laughs> and then here, I give you a bit of uh, flavor. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. You snakes, you brutal vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Okay, then Jesus was done, and he finally so got arrested, and then when he was tried for, you know, all the anger he caused, he no longer said a word. And why didn't he say a word? He said enough. By that time, you can save your breath. By that time, no one was going to listen. It's really only the court, only the leaders there. There's no longer a people there that can witness what you say. It's, 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 a, it's a done deal that produce false witnesses, and they're not prepared to listen to anything that you're going to say. So you might as well be silent. But it's not meant to be a strategy for Christians at all times. <laughs> because when you go to the uh, New Testament... Um, other Christians let fly as well. The Apostle Paul, you read the Gala book of Galatians? Doesn't even greet people properly or thank God for anything that happens in their midst. He says, look, I don't care who it is that is preaching this false gospel that is not gospel at all. 
but they be Christ. All those that preach another gospel from the one that I preach to you, let them be cursed. I don't care who it is. <coughs> Who's bewitched you? Mm. You foolish, and foolish is a harmless, it's a stronger word. And then he said, look, the opponents that keep teaching you, you know, circumcision, all the maids got to be circumcised. Why don't they go the whole way and castrate themselves? I'm quoting the Bible, so don't get stuck into me. <laughs> That's not meek and mild language. It, it, it was a pretty important issue. It was about the gospel. It was about a salvation. It was about a church that got confused by false teaching. And if they believed those voices, they would lose their salvation. You, you might as well use language that uh, communicates how important it is. Stephen, just before he died, he called them all stiff neck. He said, look, your ancestors, you always killed the prophets. You're doing exactly the same. And he was so persuasive that they just shut their ears. They, they, they did like children, blah, la, 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 la. So they couldn't hear anything and then they stoned him. Okay. I'm, I, I've made my point. I mean, the shoe can be on the... Um, If ever a word of repentance comes to you that is not meek and mild and gentle, don't be offended. It actually may be God that is just shaking you up a little bit. Sometimes if it's always meek and mild, we, we just it's so easy not to hear, brush everything off. But there will come a time and God will speak crystal clear to you and hit you right between the eyes and you're not going to be offended, you're going to listen. Okay, a modern example. Only happened about two weeks ago. I hope it's not going to be too controversial. Um, but, but you know that the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, the first ever visited Australia. Ten days ago. Right? He came. Benjamin Netanyahu. And our Prime Minister wrote on his website that he and his wife were delighted that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu um, was coming for visit and basically was saying um, the friendship between Israel, I quote him, between Israel and Australia dates back to the establishment of Israel in 1948. It is anchored in our shared values, commitment to democracy and mutual interest in a rules-based international system and an open global economy. So Israel, Australia, we, we share a lot of things in common. And then for us Christians, it is really important, our relationship with Israel, because according to the Bible, and what we know is, Israel was God's chosen nation. Before any other nations were chosen, it was um, God called Abraham, and he made him into a big nation. And the Bible is the history of God with his people, people of Israel. And then the promise was that through Israel all nations would be, would be blessed, which happened through Jesus, who was born a Jew. He's a Jew. And the, according to the Bible, we are grafted into those promises that are given to the Jews. We Gentiles are grafted in. So we have a high value, high respect, high honor of Israel. And then there are things in the Bible where God says, I still care about them. And I'm watching how they're treated by the people and the nations of this earth. And there's a really ancient, right at the beginning, uh, God said to Abraham, whoever blesses you will be blessed. And whoever curses you will be cursed. That, that's never been revoked. That's never been supplanted. That, that's eternal. So for Australia to host a prime minister of Israel is a big thing for the church. And then... You know, even if you're not Christian or... It's a democracy. It's a, it's a fellow leader. Um, you know that in the ABC and Fairfax Press, Sydney Morning Herald, there was a bit of a com campaign by apparently 60 prominent Australians that stirred up a little bit of... that we shouldn't even welcome him in Australia. 
that, that's pretty radical. I mean, we have all sorts of heads of states coming to, but we would say he's not even allowed to come into Australia because of the way they deal with the Palestinians. So, um, and then, then two former prime ministers and one former foreign minister, Bob Hawke, Kevin Rudd, and Gareth Evans. Mm -hmm. They also stirred up the pot against Israel. And then on the Saturday of Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to Australia, the foreign correspondent of the Australian let it rip, Greg Sheridan. Have you, have you read this? No. I give you a little bit of the flavour. It's a bit like the, John the Baptist. And when I was first reading it, I was stunned. I was blown away. So, <clears throat> are you ready? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a bit. I love it in a way. You can see it <coughs> I can't really admit to that. Um, what a quarter walling coven of craven zeitgeist whispers. <laughs> I don't even understand the insult. <laughs> but that's how it begins. They are Bob Hawke, Kevin Wright, and Gareth Evans. And we do honour them. Would you agree? We honour those. Men. I mean, they were former leaders, but for great job. So, we have high opinions of them. So here they are, calling for Australia to formally recognise the Palestinian state. The three of them, like the witches of Macbeth, intoning sterile incantations. <laughs> Hawk and Rudd, particularly, are always keen to lavish themselves with praise and moral cred credentials they simply do not possess. Thus Hawke, in his Australian Financial Review piece, described himself as a well-known supporter of Israel. What a lame, many of my best friends are black sort of credentials this is. <laughs> Hawke hasn't been a supporter of Israel in any meaningful sense for 30 years. His piece was full of weird basic errors of fact. He claims the Netanyahu government has approved thousands of new West Bank settlements in fact, it has approved just one. What was even more fatuous? What does fatuous mean? I had to look it up. Absolutely lacking in intelligence. <laughs> even more fatuous and hypocritical claiming Netanyahu had repeatedly torpedoed peace without giving a syllable's attention to times the Palestinian leadership has rejected full-blown peace offers along the lines of state of a state in the West Bank and Gaza and compensating land swaps from Israel. Then there was Gareth Evans, the poor man's wife, right, claiming the Arabs could provide for Israel's security. What planet does this man live on? Most Arab states cannot provide for their own security, much less anyone else's. Let's pause for a second to consider the moral courage of these antipodean metonyms. I don't, I don't get the insults, but they must mean something. <laughs> Putting the Middle East to rights. In a passage of fatuousness, unsurpassed in its banality and dishonesty, Hawke compared the Palestinians to the Jews in the Soviet Union and the blacks in South Africa and said they too had a right to be fully free. Is this an act of moral courage on Hawke's part? Presumably, a moral giant like Hawk thinks the Tibetans, like the Jews in the Soviet Union and the blacks in South Africa, also have a right to be fully free. Has he risked his lucrative Chinese business interests by courageously standing up for the Tibetans over these many years since he left the Prime Ministership? One of the few places in the world where people are actively persecuted for being Muslim? Does he speak out for free trade unions in China? To do that, would have constituted real moral courage. Do you remember Hawke doing any of that? In his... Uh, I keep going. <laughs> In his recent attention grab, Rudd characteristically praised himself as a lifelong opponent of anti-Semitism, which is all across the world, this hatred of Jews. Rudd does indeed oppose anti-Semitism when he's speaking to rich Jewish mm. audiences. But when has Rudd ever said a disobliging thing to an Arab audience about Arab anti-Semitism? In his post 
politics phase, Wright has sought a career for himself in the UN system where the Arab voting bloc is powerful and important. Now imagine if Rudd did the elementary research to familiarize himself with the extensive pro-violence, pro-terrorist, anti-Israel incitement material in Palestinian authority schools and media. Imagine if he went a step further to examine the rank classical anti-Semitism found in much Arab media and popular culture generally. Imagine if he then made a tough, un uncompromising speech to an Arab audience, rejecting and condemning this anti-Semitism. Um, okay, so he keeps going. Or is it that they have enjoyed, no doubt, unconsciously the pleasures of the bully and the coward through history, kicking the boy in the playground, everyone else is kicking. Okay, then he exposes, then he reasons with them, and he exposes seven myths that people believe that bring them to that view. Uh, I give you a bit of, I give you two of them. Myth two is that Israel won't negotiate or won't compromise. This is inconsistent with simple facts. On three occasions, twice under Yehud Barak and once under Yehud Olmert, Israel offered the Palestinians virtually everything that could be offered in an independent state. Israel was prepared to take enormous risks with its own security. This is all documented in countless American books. On each occasion, the Palestinian leaders walked away. One reason surely is that the Palestinian who first agrees to a comprehensive peace deal with Israel that involves the end of claims and full acceptance of Israel will be assassinated by extremists in his own camp. <coughs> um, and then he actually acknowledges that the Labour, the opposition leader, the Labour leader, and the um, shadow foreign minister, um, Wong, they actually agree with our government. They actually welcome Benjamin Netanyahu and completely disagree, disagree with Paul Rudd and Evans. Okay, myth six is that Israel is uniquely evil in the world. This too requires a complete suspension of normal faculties to sustain. Israel is, as Turnbull says, the unique beacon of liberal democracy in the Middle East. Israel certainly makes mistakes, including moral mistakes. But consider its security situation. On its southern border in, border in the Sinai, it faces an Islamic State-affiliated terror campaign. On its Gaza border, it faces Hamas. Just Google its charter for a tour of operatic anti-Semitism in full voice and its Islamic Jihad. On its northern border with Syria, it faces both Islamic State and Al-Qaeda affiliates. On its border with Lebanon, it faces Hezbollah which Australian law defines as a terrorist organization and has tens of thousands of missiles trained on Israel. And nearby in Iran, Iran, it faces a naval racing towards nuclear weapon capability, which has often declared its intention to wipe Israel off the map. In the face of all this, Israel behaves as well as any Western nation would. Okay, enough. So was Greg Sheridan out of line, calling our respected former leaders, the three amigos, extreme in their banality and dishonesty, lacking moral compass and moral fiber. Under normal circumstances, I would say yes. That's not honoring our leadership. Would you agree? We are meant to be respectful to our elders. I mean, I, I gave you this quote because I'm probably partial to the idea that he was a bit like John the Baptist in Jesus. He was speaking up when he was really needed. Because you have the whole press, ABC, um, majority of Labour, Sydney Morning Herald, it is such, their lies, dishonesty, hypo hypocrisy, yeah. you know, and it gets proclaimed and proclaimed and proclaimed and proclaimed. So if you just have an opinion piece where you say meekly, oh, I disagree, I have a different view, no one's going to take notice. No. You, you've got to throw in a few grenades. 
and say, you're totally out of line. You won't change their minds, I'm sure. But any readership of the newspaper will have another look. I think that's what Jesus did with the religious leadership of his day. When he came with the message of repentance, he was very clear the nation was his. Yeah, he, he grew up in Nazareth and they were seated in, in Jerusalem, but that's not how it would remain. The nation would be his, the people would be his, he's the Lord, all nations are his. It would take a while to get there, but he would confront, he would not walk away, he wouldn't just say, oh yeah, you do your bit, as long as I'm here in my little niche, in my little corner, as long as no one bothers me, I'm, I'm happy in my holy little huddle with my 12 disciples. It's not Jesus. He's actually, he's taking the world, he has bigger plans, and um, the same is still going on. It does cost us, you know, he, he confronted, but it cost him everything. And he suffered and he died, but the victory is God's, and we're meant to continue it. This morning, um, another word that John the Baptist said, you know, he, he, right at the beginning, he warned the Sadducees and Pharisees, he warned that when the one comes after him, the winnowing fork is already in his hand, and he would separate the wheat from the chaff. And he would, any, any tree, any plant that is not producing fruit, he would cut down. So judgment, people already heard that it would begin with Jesus. And then he said, you know, I have the message with repentance and I baptize you with water, but when he comes, he comes with the message of repentance and he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And fire of the Holy Spirit when he comes. There's a bit of cleansing going on. The Holy Spirit backs up repentance. So if, if you find you know, a bit of conviction coming as the Holy Spirit comes on you and actually upping the ante about repentance, confronting something in you, that's according to plan. It's nothing wrong. Just encourage all of us to hear and to plan. Amen. Lord, I, I pray. I pray that you give us wisdom. I pray that you give, give us wisdom in the ministry when to withdraw, when to confront, what to do. And Lord, I pray that this morning, right now, you make us hear first the message of repentance. Lord, we just open the doors of our minds, of our hearts. And Lord, if you have something to say to us that is not pleasing to you, that is in us. Lord, I pray that you Baptize us with your spirit and with your fire. I pray that you cleanse us. That you identify the sin that is not pleasing to you and that you confront it. And I pray that we hear it. Lord, I pray that you don't have to inflame anything in your relationship with us. Lord, I pray that we hear it when you speak to us gently. Lord, because we are hungry. We are hungry for that thing. <coughs> We're hungry for the life with you, and Lord, I pray right now. We're not resisting you, but we recognize the strength, the fierceness that comes with you. You're a holy God. You're jealous for this world. This is your creation. You take possession of everything that you've created. And Lord, you judge and discard everything that is not willing to listen. And Lord, we want to be disciplined in the right way and we want to listen. So I pray that repentance comes to us right now. In Jesus' name.